CubeSat. I'd like to talk today about uh, a mission, well, something which was a CubeSat Deep Space Mission concept for a while and was actually selected by the HOMD Next Step program for inclusion in uh, the group of the first Deep Space CubeSats that will be launched from EM1 in 2018 as of, as of now. Um, and I'd like to give some perspective on the challenges faced by people who want to do Deep Space CubeSat development and design along the way. Um, this is a team, this uh, CubeSat selection is, really is the first Deep Space CubeSat that has a very significant Goddard participation. Goddard will be providing the payload, the flight dynamics support, very tricky for CubeSat's a very extremely important part of that. And uh, also a lot of input for operating around the moon, including thermal and mechanical design support. Um, I am the science PI and this is led by uh, Moorhead State University. Um, who is basically, actually they, they probably, it could fairly be said, they provided the first deep space CubeSat design, which isn't the final design for Lunar Flashlight, but it was certainly the first one that they basically came up with. So they're very experienced at CubeSat um, platform uh, development, design development, uh, integration and testing. So they will be providing the bus and they will do the final integration. And there are a lot of other people that are not mentioned here that have played a role and I don't want to underestimate the role, one of the things we emphasized in doing the studies that we've done that was supported by internal R&D support at Goddard was, uh, was thermal and mechanical design. And for the moon, thermal design is, is really critical. Now, how do I change this? A pointer. Oh, right, right, okay. Here we go. Uh, yeah, I don't need to say this because this is, you know, probably this talk should have been presented on Tuesday, but it wasn't. <laughs> So these basically are the selected or about to be selected uh, candidates, uh, actually they're missions, for launch from EM1. Um, and so far we have, they're all, they're all five of them that have been selected are from HOMD, but the Simplex selection is coming up and HTIDES is actually the, the uh, astro, the um, astrophysics program, uh, I'm sorry, heliophysics program has actually made a selection. And there are a number from the uh, Space Technology Mission Directorate that I don't, particularly know about, but there will be several of those as well. And there's a rumor that there'll be more than 11. How many more? I don't know. Another ring? It's been discussed. There's some serious issues with doing more, but all of these, it should be pointed out, are prototypes. Every single one of them, none of these subsystems, despite a lot of experience by the providers of subsystems and instruments, have actually flown in deep space before. So for our particular uh, mission, we're looking at, these are our primary goals. Um, we want to, we are looking at a broadband IR, IR instrument, which does provide some challenges because um, it, it does need to be, be kept quite cool. But the broadband uh, spectral capability allows us to get a good handle on the composition and distribution of volatiles in the regolith and provide a, con a mineralogy context at the same time. And of course, this could be used for the regolith, characterizing the, the regolith uh, of mineralogically and in terms of volatiles of other places as well. And we are looking at doing this systematically um, as a function of time of day, latitude, regolith age, and composition. And we use, of course, an extensive database that's already been collected by LRO to be able to make these associations and do it systematically. Um, the, uh, we also, by doing this, by looking at uh, variations in time of day and, and latitude, um, as well as more transient effects that might have to do with variations in solar output, um, we can begin to take a look at the dynamic aspect of interaction with volatiles, um, solar wind plasma, um, and the regolith itself. Um, the, we also, of course, addressed, the, we were selected by HOMD because we addressed an important strategic knowledge, knowledge gap related to lunar volatile distribution. And we provide a context for lunar flashlight, which is going to focus on the permanently shadowed regions, narrow enough the poles to characterize those, the three critical um, bands in terms of um, surface ice. We can provide a larger volatile context to look at volatiles, what happens to them as a function of time of day, and uh, how much variation there is by, by latitude, and provide a nice context. Um, so 
a lot of you know that this the, the I don't have to tell you guys that there's been a tremendous change in our looking at the moon in terms of the kind of environment it is over the last decade. And some of the critical pieces of information that changed our mind about the important role of volatiles, probably not only everywhere in the solar system, but potentially everywhere in the universe, are the kinds of information that I put on this slide. So we have um, a picture over on the right-hand side of the snapshot that M3 provided to look at the um, presence of hydroxyl, especially as you approach the poles, implying, of course, that there is a temperature and time of day um, aspect to the distribution of volatiles on the surface and in the lunar exosphere. Um, also, evidence um, published by Sunshine et al. from uh, the Cassini-Vims experiment, I believe, that saw a distinctive difference depending on time of day when the moon was observed associated with a feature where there's a, a, a water feature, an ice feature, at, at noon. Um, and l -cross, of course, as ex exemplified by the graph on the right-hand side, gave an indication of uh, the wide variety of subsurface volatiles that exist on the lunar surface. We will take advantage of all of this data that has, have provided kind of snapshots of um, the role of volatiles, hydroxyl water, in various forms on the lunar surface um, in doing our systematic look over a six-month period of variations in uh, volatiles as a function of time of day and other things. And on the left-hand side, please do not read this. This is just a slide that kind of shows what kinds of features we can expect to see, especially as we go from about 2.5 to, to beyond three, three microns. We can um, capture thoroughly uh, capture on both sides a three micron band. We are not, we don't have an arbitrary cutoff at, at, at basically three microns, um, which some, many of the other um, instruments has, have had, and that's deliberate. We want to be able to thoroughly characterize features associated with water and ice that are found uh, around three microns. Now, what does our instrument look like? Well, it's important to po point out that, that probably a lot of uh, CubeSat folks who are developing CubeSat instruments would say this. So we aren't exactly starting from scratch. We actually are using heritage from the OSIRIS-REx OVIRS uh, instrument design. It is a similar instrument with a similar detector and a linear variable filter, um, which, of which provides line separation with, with very little um, expenditure of volume and mass and power. Um, and we are also incorporating a compact microcooler, a tactical microcooler developed by RICOR. Um, and this is basically to keep the detector extremely cold. Our goal is 120K or below. Um, and that's so that we can provide uh, longer wavelength coverage, essentially uh, above three microns especially. In addition, we need to keep the optics box cool. This is a challenge that the um, OVIRS instrument does not have because it's a much cooler environment than we're going to be in. You know, we basically have a kind of orbit that gets us very hot and very cold in orbit, so we do need to be thinking about a special radiator design for the optics box to keep the optics box at 220K or below. And this is one of the outcomes of doing the extensive thermal modeling that we've done over the last couple of years. Um, and there's easy pictures. Basically, this is the optics box uh, cryocooler. Um, basically, the two off-axis mirrors here. We have an adjustable iris that maintains a spot size regardless of altitude while we are going through the through periapsis in the illuminated hemisphere, and the detector with the linear variable filter right here. This is a picture of one of the predecessors of OVIRS, which was the Ralph instrument that flew on New Horizons that is flying on New Horizons. And just for comparison, just for fun here, look, the differences in mass, power, and size are uh, quite you know very clearly. Now we're looking at a basically a 1.5 U instrument here over a very large, relatively large instrument for Ralph, and OVIRS is, is similar to, to Ralph in, in design. And other components include the, this is the H1 R, Teledyne H1RG Mercat Telluride uh, detector with a linear variable filter assembly. And this is a schematic of the adjustable iris that maintains our spot size at 10 kilometers regardless of size. This is a point spectrometer. Everyone who's flying an instrument in CubeSat today um, beyond low Earth orbit 
has to figure out ways to keep the data rate generation relatively low. So our way of doing it is that we look at high spectral resolution uh, areas on the lunar surface, larger spot sizes. Lunar flashlight looks at only three bands and only certain kinds of features. They limit the coverage in, in both spe spectrally and spatially. Um, until we can solve the problem of uh, communication to provide a much higher um, downlink rate, we're going to be in this boat. Not that we can't provide significant scientific data, but basically we make certain, we look at the trade space basically to be able to minimize the kind of the volume of data that we generate. And that, that's, uh, that's a schematic basically of the instrument. And uh, here's a picture of the uh, RICOR uh, 526S, I think it is, or 562S a tactical uh, crack cooler. This is our basically our concept. We uh, enter into a uh, equatorial periapsis orbit that takes us 100 kilometers at periapsis, approximately over the equator. Um, we, we go from about, uh, say, 250 to 100 kilometers, maintaining a spot size of 10 kilometers as we go from um, pole to pole. Um, and we are in the kind of orbit that allows us to observe the moon back over the same real estate we've looked at in the previous lunar cycle, a once a lunar cycle. So that should give us a, you know, the function of time of day thing that we're looking for. And we can anticipate that, although we don't know exactly what areas we will cover because we cannot know the final, you know, how, what, what, all the details of the final release we will have from EM1 and or the exact nature of the uh, low energy trajectory we will take, we will take a trajectory that will allow us to, ent to do lunar capture at approximately, um, um, at approximately the um, periapsis and apoapsis we want. So we will not have to do a lot of um, angle change, which would require tremendous amounts of delta V. And that's one of the tricks of doing these low energy trajectories, which are very important, to basically design the trajectory so that your lunar capture is similar in terms of relative placement over your target to where you finally want to end up. So we will basically only have to essentially lower apoapsis and periapsis to get to our, to get to our final science orbit. And during that time, we'll be able to take some data once we get into lunar capture. That, that'll make some sense uh, for the move. Two minutes, okay, thanks. Um, and this is just what I was talking about. I won't go into details, but this is like what these trajectories look like. We're looking at a period of at least six months to get to lunar capture, uh, two or three months to go from capture to our science orbit, and then a six-month nominal mission. This is a picture of the Busek Iodon ion propulsion system, which they're developing now and testing very successfully. Again, it'll be the first time flying, along with a lot of other systems on board. Um, but I j just notice um, how much space. This is just this is the thruster itself, but a lot of the space in the total volume goes into the controllers. So, um, you know, one of the things we're looking at is reducing the volume by actually looking at more compact electronics, which is an important aspect of what we're doing with the instrument, too. We're developing compact electronics that can be used for similar kinds of detectors. These are some points about the bus. I talked about the need for the thermal design, communication and tracking. The only game in town for most of us is X-Band. The um, Moorhead folks provide a ground system that will allow us to have a lot of access without having to go through the DSN to the time we need to do downlink our data. And you know, we're carrying out a basically very compact onboard X-band communication system. Uh, we, have, we have two or three computers uh, to act as backup. Um, and the Blue Canyon technology folks uh, really probably have some of the best uh, attitude control systems and will be used Goddard basically to support navigation and tracking. Thermal design I talked about. This is a picture of, uh, this is what our spacecraft will look like. Solar panels, um, basically it's oriented kind of upside down. Here's the spectrometer. So that's actually Nader in that direction there. Solar panels, the propulsion system, um, uh, batteries, wherever we can put them. Um, that's kind of what we look like. This is what we'll look like deployed basically and over the lunar surface. This, uh, we don't have to read this again, but this is just to give you an idea of what kind of resource we're using in terms of mass, power, mass and power and volume. Um, we actually have a great deal of margin and volume that we did not anticipate, according to the EM1 folks. And it's a little scary to hear the PI saying things like, well, don't worry about volume, because that's, of course, the thing you worry about most with CubeSats. If everybody takes another U of volume, we'll be in a lot of trouble. So volume is really the critical 
uh, parameter with CubeSats. And if you want to um, really dig in and find out how you can turn your science investigation into a low-cost uh, platform that could potentially be deployed on the lunar surface or in lunar orbit over the next five years rather than waiting 10 or 15 years, please come to the fifth international workshop on lunar cubes, which will be held in this area in October, October 6 to 9. We have interactive design challenges. It isn't just formal presentations. And there'll be plenty of opportunity to meet people, engineers who have solved some of these problems, are working on them, come up with potential solutions, talk with about things like the, inf the communication infrastructure, and uh, to present ideas that the people who design these subsystems need to hear, design them properly to meet our science requirements. So it's a great opportunity to do that. Are there any questions? Thanks, Pam. Right. Oh, there's a question. Uh, actually, we kind of have to press. Um, okay. If you can 